the devastating earthquake in Turkey and Syria is sending shockwaves of concern half a world away to California. These workers are retrofitting an older residential building to make it more earthquake resistant. The main thing we're doing is we've installed this wide flange column and it's going to be connected to this foundation here. Many such buildings were built without enough steel to reinforce concrete structural pillars and beams. They lack what engineers call ductile strength. So the word ductile, it, yeah, it has to do with flexibility. A uh, building has to be able to move a little bit. And concrete is really strong, but it's, it's a little brittle. It's not very flexible. And so having enough steel inside is what makes it flexible because steel is very ductile. The magnitude 7.8 Turkey-Syria quake happened in a seismic zone strikingly similar to the San Andreas Fault, which runs through Los Angeles County, home to 9.3 million people. They're actually very similar uh, quake zones or uh, fault zones. Southern California is no stranger to large earthquakes. The 1994 Northridge quake was a magnitude 6.7, and it could happen again. In Los Angeles, there are about 1,200 older buildings, like this one, that engineers say would be heavily damaged if the city were struck by an earthquake of the same magnitude as the one that hit Turkey and Syria. The Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors recently voted to create new rules requiring retrofitting of older non-ductile buildings and to create an inventory of vulnerable structures. Experts who have modeled quake scenarios say loss of life in the event of a major L.A. quake would be much smaller than in Turkey and Syria because of better construction. Nonetheless, there will be uh, loss of life and there will be some uh, you know, destruction and People are going to have to rebuild. It's going to be a big hit. The worst part will be the aftermath, with major highways possibly severed, electric power and water pumping stations knocked offline for weeks. Los Angeles is preparing itself, but the forces slowly grinding beneath the surface are unstoppable. Rob Reynolds, Al Jazeera, Los Angeles. Of steam before this nuclear plant is taken off the grid. Activists celebrate what they call a historic moment. We were the thorn in the side of politicians, and it's great that we have been successful. A victory after 50 years of rallying against what they call a dangerous source of energy. The Chernobyl explosion in 1986 in the then Soviet Union led to a wave of protests. Radioactive particles fell in Germany and elsewhere across Europe. The closure of the three remaining German plants scheduled to shut down last year had been postponed because of the energy crisis sparked by the war in Ukraine. Germany remains deeply divided about the closure of the nuclear plants. The decision taken by Chancellor Olaf Scholz after political pressure by his coalition partner the Greens has been called irrational during an energy crisis. And a recent survey suggests that 60% of the population want to continue to use nuclear energy for now. 20 professors at technical universities filed a petition to reverse the decision. It will increase the CO2 emissions of Germany, and this is the opposite of what Germany has pledged. Second, it will reduce the reliability of the German energy system. And third, it will contribute to rising electricity prices, both for industry and consumers. He says the government will be forced to use more coal until Germany has found an affordable way to store renewable energy. Closing nuclear plants does not mean the end of nuclear dangers. Germany is struggling to find a permanent storage facility for more than 10,000 tons of highly radioactive waste stored at 16 interim locations, much to the concern of the mayors in these municipalities. The last 12 months these past 12 months, we have become aware of what it means if there is a war situation, risks we can't protect ourselves against, like what we have seen in Ukraine. We don't wish something like this to happen, but we can't exclude it. Nuclear waste will now have to stay in those locations until as late as the year 2100, before it can be moved to a permanent location, showing that the nuclear era is far from over. Stepfasen, Al Jazeera, Neckar Westheim, Germany. Heavy fighting spreads through Khartoum as tensions between the Sudanese army and a powerful paramilitary force spill over into the streets. 
The army says it's defending itself from attacks by the rapid support forces across the capital. It's now designating the force as a rebel group. The RSF is trying to assault many critical positions. Our forces are deployed and discharging their duties defending those positions. Fighting has been underway since this morning until this moment. This is a battle for our national dignity. But the rapid support forces say their bases were attacked by the army. This battle will pave the way to a peaceful solution. All those criminals will stand trials. I cannot give a time limit to the fighting. However, we are adamant to end it with the least of losses. All flights have been cancelled at Khartoum International Airport where armed men are on the tarmac and rapid support forces have taken control of state television service Sudan TV. This was the moment the station's broadcast was cut. Tensions between the army and the rapid support forces emerged months after a military takeover in 2021 and they heightened when talks to integrate the RSF into the army stalled. I really feel very sad and very angry. Actually, I'm enraged. And I, see, I, I, I say to both of them, shame on you, both of you. You have been entrusted uh, for this great revolution and uh, you already committed an unsensical coup. Speaking in Vietnam, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said Washington would continue to support Sudan's transition to a civilian-led government. It's a fragile situation. There are other actors that may be pushing against that, that progress, but uh, this is a real opportunity to finally carry forward the um, civilian-led transition, and one that we and, and other countries are trying to, uh, to bolster. People across Sudan are bracing themselves for more fighting, a new crisis and an uncertain future. Victoria Gatenby, Al Jazeera. Masia Sumbani is working her way through dead crops after Cyclone Freddy devastated this farm in Moamba in southern Mozambique. Heavy flooding after the cyclone destroyed much of the maize, tomatoes and cucumbers grown here. Now she has to start from scratch. Farming is what I do for a living. We also have to hire people to work the land. When flooding happens, we lose our crops. We still have to pay the workers and also treat the land. So it's loss after loss. Experts are worried about the worsening effects of climate change and what it means for food production in a country where two-thirds of the population relies on agriculture and fishing. This is the coastal city of Beira, four years ago after Cyclone Idai hit. It was one of the worst tropical cyclones in the southern hemisphere. It affected millions of people across Mozambique, Malawi and Zimbabwe. Experts say this region of the Indian Ocean has the highest average increase in surface temperature of all tropical oceans. Higher temperatures mean more energy to supercharge weather systems, which they say are increasingly developing into cyclones. Most recently, Cyclone Freddy was the longest surviving tropical storm in recorded history, regaining strength six times over. Many floodplains and low coastal areas make Mozambique vulnerable to flooding. It's been concerning for two things. First, they have had, they've been bigger and more frequent. And that's concerning because um, we're going to, and it's not just that a lot of times we focus on the cyclones um, because they are very, and the flooding, it's very dramatic. It is um, very um, visually shocking. But we have other impacts like droughts. The droughts in the 80s and 90s killed over 100,000 people, but it was every month people dying over a long period of time. It doesn't catch the media attention. So the climate is, is scary in not only in all aspects, in the floods, the droughts, the, um, it is, it's really, and if we're really struggling with what's now, and this is the beginning, it's gonna get worse. In the last decade, Mozambique's been hit by several high intensity tropical cyclones killing many, destroying buildings, and costing the economy billions of dollars. And experts say it should prepare for more. Famida Mala, Al Jazeera, Maputo, Mozambique. A fanfare for friendship. Brazilian President Luis Inácio Lula da Silva is the latest in a recent line of international leaders to be given the red carpet treatment by China's leader, Xi Jinping. 
in exchange, a show of solidarity from Lula towards Beijing's effort to broker a peace deal in Ukraine. Chinese state media say the leaders agreed dialogue and negotiations are the only way out of the conflict. Analysts say that bolsters China's efforts to work with partners in the BRICS alliance of Brazil, India, Russia and South Africa, and counter a US-led strategy of sanctioning Moscow while offering military support to Ukraine. It's important to remember that Brazil is an instrumental part of BRICS and more generally speaking China's multipolar world order that's touted as, you know, at the very least President Xi's conception of a world where you do not have a single hegemon, but instead a polycentric world where Brazil, China and other leading countries in the global south can comprise a prominent pole that balances against uh, what they view to be Western hegemony, so to speak. It's not just politics on the presidential agenda. The two leaders have signed a raft of business deals covering agriculture, energy and infrastructure. China has been Brazil's largest trading partner for more than a decade. Last year, bilateral trade topped $150 billion. That's almost double the figure between Brazil and the United States. In addition to securing new trade ties during his time in China, President Lula has ushered in the appointment of Brazil's former leader, Dilma Rousseff, as the head of the BRICS New Development Bank. Bangladesh, Egypt, Uruguay and the United Arab Emirates are also joining the bank. It's a move that's set to expand funding for developing countries and extend Beijing's global sphere of influence. That's what Brazil is bringing. It's bringing, here I am, I'm a big country, and this is not only about China, this is about the global south, as we understand it, we Brazilians in China. China will accommodate that message now because it's, it's, it's in interest. But I think we need to realize that, that that's a, it's a very, very... Um, um, asymmetric uh, BRICS, uh, no matter the word alliance. It's an alliance that's attracting increasing attention. More than a dozen countries have expressed interest in joining BRICS, including Iran and Saudi Arabia. China is backing an expansion of the bloc. If it gets its way, there may be a need for even more red carpet rollouts in Beijing in the near future. Richard Kimber, Al Jazeera, Hong Kong. Despite a recent surge of mass shootings, the world's biggest gun lobby is more defiant than ever. NRA members, fight like hell for freedom and get more of it and win over and over and over again. Just weeks after a school shooting in Nashville and days after a Louisville workplace massacre, the National Rifle Association is holding its annual conference with speeches by every major contender for the 2024 Republican presidential nomination. We saved our Second Amendment, and we're going to save it for a long time to come. It's under siege, but we're going to save it for a long time to come, forever. But we don't need gun control. We need crime control. Outside, a dozen or so protesters, including two graduates of Michigan State University, site of a mass shooting in February, called for a ban on assault rifles, the weapon of choice of mass shooters. I, I think there's no reason for them. It, I really would love to get rid of all of them. The proliferation of guns is just outrageous. The NRA has fallen on hard times in recent years. It's lost a million of what was five million members in 2018, and it's being sued by the New York State Attorney General for violating state laws with with lavish spending on its leaders. After successfully pushing as a senator for a ban on assault weapons that expired in 2004, President Biden has called for that ban to be renewed. Ban assault weapons now. Ban them now. Once and for all. But that's not likely to happen in a divided Congress, where the NRA's influence remains strong enough to block any major changes in U.S. gun laws. On the state level, legislatures are actually easing gun laws. Last year, Indiana joined 21 other states in eliminating permits, allowing gun owners to carry their weapons in public without certification or a background check, leaving more guns on the street in a nation that already has more of them than any other. John Hendren, Al Jazeera, Indianapolis. Struggling with constant inflation has become a part of Amalia Barraza's daily life. Her meager salary as a housemaid is barely enough to care for her four children and pay for basic services. 
It is so difficult lately. We are not buying many things like beef or chicken that have become too expensive. But I don't lose hope that things will change so we can all live better. Amalia lives in a very poor neighborhood in Buenos Aires. It is in areas like this where the impact of spiraling inflation is hitting the hardest. On the streets, many blame the current government of Alberto Fernandez and the IMF. Argentina is struggling with over 100% inflation in the past year and rising poverty. This country has had over 20 programs with International Monetary Fund. It has defaulted on its debt seven times in its history and until now has been unable to resolve the chronic problems that exist in the economy. Trade union leader Hugo Godoy says the problem is that Argentina is constantly trying to solve its problems in the same way. The government is tied and under the control of the IMF, and the plan for Argentina is only about increasing inflation and generating a recession at the expense of the poor, because it always goes back to implementing austerity measures. In 2022, the government and the IMF signed an agreement renegotiating the $44 billion debt former President Mauricio Macri acquired in 2018. It was the largest loan in the fund's history. The new deal includes an economic program that Argentina must comply with in order to receive disbursements every three months. The problem is that the COVID pandemic, the war in Ukraine and the worst drought in years have further complicated the economy, making it more difficult for Argentina to meet its obligations. When you look at the new agreements and you consider how the agreements have been in the past, it has been much more flexible. And with the war and the drought, all agreements were reviewed and adapted to the economic reality. The fund today is not the problem, and it's not the salvation you need to fix certain problems in the economy. Argentines are longing for economic stability. Exchange rate controls, constant price changes and economic hardship are having a huge impact on people's lives. But the crisis and the uncertainty over the presidential elections scheduled for October are unlikely to bring the changes people here so desperately need. Teresa Bo, Al Jazeera, Buenos Aires. School professor Francisco Cañón was 15 years old when the eruption of the Nevado de Ruiz volcano hit the town of Murillo in 1985. The memories of fleeing with his father as burning rocks hurled through the night and the roar of the landslide still haunt him to this day. Even if I was very young, I had the impression that the earth could cave in or that something was arriving from the sky. Now that the volcano might be erupting again, he packed a backpack with a radio, a light, documents and medicines to be ready to run again. People living in the shadows of the Nevado de Ruiz have been on high alert for two weeks. Authorities say the volcano might be days or weeks away from another major eruption. And no one knows where it will hit the hardest. Luz Nelly, who lived in a rural area close to the volcano, still gets emotional remembering how she and her three children miraculously survived. For days I wouldn't go to bed thinking it would come back and I wouldn't be able to open my eyes again. I would think about my kids. It's very hard to remember because I suffered so much. It stays with you. While Murillo re-emerged relatively unscathed, another town, Armero, was completely wiped away, killing 25,000 people. A gigantic landslide traveled for more than 50 kilometers through the night, burying Armero in a matter of minutes and leaving its residents without a chance to survive. Despite the past tragedy, authorities are struggling to convince many farmers in high-risk areas to evacuate, and soldiers have been deployed to stop vehicles from heading to the volcano. Geologists say they are worried by the fact that the activity inside the volcano is the closest it has been to the one that preceded the 1985 eruption, even if there are differences. In 1985, the volcano was closed. Gases didn't have a way out. Today, the system is more open, yet the seismic activity is similar, especially in the southwest of the volcano. 
A dangerous omen from a volcano that has already shown to be capable of explosive eruptions and landslides that swallow everything in their path. Alessandro Rampietti, Al Jazeera Armero. Since the cholera outbreak began in September, there have been more than 22,000 cases in Mozambique alone. There's concern that there are rising number of cholera cases in, in many countries in Africa, parts of southern and eastern Africa. And what concerns authorities here in Mozambique, health workers and other authorities, is that people continue to use open streams and rivers like this one to collect water for their everyday needs. They use it to bathe, they use it to clean their homes and to cook with. And very few of them have any other option. There's no running water in many places, specifically rural areas, and that's why people come to rivers like this one. People here don't know if there are waterborne diseases here, and because they don't have an option, they continue to collect water. Now, aid agencies are saying that they want to assess various water bodies and also treat them, but that hasn't happened in many places. The government is also distributing about 2 million vaccines. They want that distributed through the year. So far, a few hundred thousand have been distributed, but there's also concern that that isn't enough. There's also an awareness campaign that's going on through various districts in Mozambique to make people aware of the dangers of a certain water, the dangers of water born diseases and what they can do to protect themselves but as long as people use streams and rivers just like this and they don't know if the water is safe it's not certain whether or not the cholera outbreak will end anytime soon researchers are calling it a turning point in the struggle against malaria in a global first, Ghana has approved a vaccine against the mosquito-borne disease. The United Nations says more than 600,000 people die from the disease each year. On average, one child dies every minute. And it's children who face the highest risk of death. Scientists at Oxford University in the UK say they've spent decades researching the vaccine. And Ghana is the first African country where it will be used, and on young children between five months and three years old. The World Health Organization is also considering whether to approve the vaccine. 200 million doses are to be produced annually. Scientists say it's a game changer in the battle against a virus that is one of the leading killers of children in Africa. Lina Abakle, Al Jazeera. Lebanon is buying wheat through a World Bank loan. It's the only way to ensure the price of bread, a main staple, remains subsidized. The state is nearly bankrupt and struggling to pay importers in dollars. If it was not for the World Bank loan, today we would have been looking at a price of bread that is over 120,000 Lebanese liras which is almost uh, twice the, the current price. The wheat loan is one of many projects financed by the World Bank. Roughly 80,000 families are receiving cash assistance as part of a social safety net program it helped build. But it has set conditions on funding that's not for emergency use. For example, in order for the nearly collapsed energy industry to get funding, Lebanon has to audit the state electricity company responsible for much of the government's debt. The international community says it won't bail out a political class accused of decades of corruption. It says the financial lifeline Lebanon needs will only come through an agreement with the International Monetary Fund. And that requires economic and fiscal reforms and proper oversight over public finances. But decision makers backed by the business elite have not shown interest. So far, they've made the public pay for an estimated $70 billion in losses. There is a clear path uh, that has been taken that has seen most of the deposits in the banking se sector liquidated or lirified, uh, if one can say, at a, very at a very discounted rate. And we have seen that for you know, $30, $40 billion so far. All the while, the economic situation is worsening, with inflation in triple digits. 
The government has been absent. It's done nothing. The economy is in ruins and unemployment is high. Analysts say an IMF program would unlock billions of dollars in funding and also gives investors confidence the country is reforming. And many warn, without that, Lebanon could face a never-ending crisis that will have irreversible consequences, especially for the poor. Zanakhudar Al Jazeera, Beirut. Welcome to the program. Japan and South Korea say North Korea has launched a missile off the east coast of the Korean peninsula. Japan's government temporarily sounded air sirens in Hokkaido, expecting the missile to land near the island. The country's land ministry warned planes flying in Japan's airspace about the missile. South Korea's Coast Guard says it could be a ballistic missile. Robert Bright joins us now from Seoul. Uh, Rob, what more do we know about this missile launch? Yeah, it does seem to be one of the uh, more provocative uh, longer range missiles that we know North Korea has and has been uh, testing. It was detected just before 7.30 a.m. local time Thursday morning, being launched from close to Pyongyang from where the North has launched its longer range missiles before now. Uh, it was determined to be traveling east as they invariably do and it was while it was over the sea that separates the Korean Peninsula from Japan that the authorities in the northern island of Hokkaido issued this uh, alert for people to take shelter saying that uh, they were tracking this missile and it was it, it would imminently land the fear being that it may uh, or parts of the debris may have landed around the island. Before now on some of the more provocative launches that the North has carried out. They have fired missiles over the top of Hokkaido out into the Pacific Ocean. This actually fell a lot shorter uh, than uh, Hokkaido, uh, but it was determined to have had quite a lofty trajectory. It went up to an altitude, they reckon, of around 3,000 kilometers. Um, the ICBMs, the intercontinental ballistic missiles that we know the North has and has been testing, uh, they have reached uh, an altitude, an apogee of around 6,000 kilometers. So they're still trying to determine whether this was a medium range or an ICBM. In recent weeks, Rob, dare I say it, even in recent months, we've sort of seen various announcements from the North about missile launches. So what sort of expectation is there where you are that there may be more to come? Yeah, there's been increasing anticipation that the North was preparing um, a more provocative uh, type of missile test. Uh, there's been increasingly belligerent rhetoric coming out of the North about the uh, joint military exercises taking place this spring between the U.S. and South Korean forces. Also, April sees a number of important anniversaries, and we know that the North will often mark those anniversaries with some sort of dramatic missile test. And we have in a couple of days here uh, the so-called Day of the Sun. That's the 111th anniversary of the birth date of uh, Kim Il-sung, the founder of North Korea. Uh, and also, finally, um, the North has not been picking up the hotline, the hotlines that exist between the South and the North to try to de-escalate tensions and clear up any misunderstandings. They make in the mornings and afternoons a regular phone call just to make sure the lines are working. Well, since last Friday, so that's six days, nearly a week, the North simply hasn't been picking up. Rob, it's good to get the update. Of course, we'll uh, follow uh, events with you from South Korea as the hours progress. Thank you. Jollof rice, a West African delicacy, at the center of a debate as to which country prepares it best. Nigeria, Ghana and Senegal all claim to its originality and taste. Here in Nigeria, this dish may soon lose either its taste or affordability. It's all because of this bug that damages the dish's main ingredient. Tuta absoluta, or the tomato leaf miner, is a stubborn pest that so far has put several tomato farmers out of business. The farmers cannot get even 10% of what they have invested in tomato cultivation. This season, the infestation has caused losses in millions of dollars, causing shortages. And that's not only eaten into the income of farmers, but also hoteliers. Preparing Nigeria's favorite dish is no longer cheap. The little we have here, has, or have, the prices also has to be affected, so it's high. And that has translated into an increase in the price of whatever foodstuff, uh, whatever uh, food we also make in our restaurants. 
The Tomato Farmers Association says this year's outbreak has resulted in a loss of output by almost 70%, pushing tomato prices higher by 450%. The tomato leaf miner lays about 260 eggs, and when they hatch, they are voracious eaters. They feed inside the leaves, the stem and flowers of the plant, then target whatever food that survives. Losses after an infestation can be as high as 100%. Farmers say climate change is creating perfect breeding conditions for the bug. They say early detection will minimize losses. But for now, all known pesticides, they say, have failed to eradicate it. And until a solution is found, farmers' losses will continue. And the cost and taste of Nigeria's jollof rice may never be the same again. Ahmed Idris, Al Jazeera, Kanu, Nigeria.